Well, it's great to be here, and uh, and uh, I love that Chris said a little prayer uh, before I start speaking, and uh, but I think I need all the prayer I could get. So if you just join me, I'm gonna just pray again. But Father, in Jesus' precious name, I thank you uh, for the honor and the privilege of speaking to these good people. And uh, they didn't come here to to hear the wisdom of the world. They came here uh, to hear your truth. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would just anoint me with your spirit to proclaim your truth. And I pray that, uh, that I would not lead anyone astray. I pray that you'd open hearts and minds to receive your truth. And I pray that if anything uh, I say tonight is not honoring to you, I pray that it would just go in one ear and out the other. We want you to be glorified. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it's great to be here. And, and Chris... Uh, asked me to speak on the biblical basis for apologetics. And apologetics is basically defending the faith. And, and I, th I think that's one of the things we need more of in our country today is, is a passion for God and a passion for his word. And I, you know, I teach at a Christian high school, uh, Cross Point Academy in Bremerton, Washington. And I try to get that. I teach Bible. I also teach weightlifting. But... Um, I try to get that point across to my students that, uh, that we should have a passion for God's word. So I, I often uh, really, you know, hope that the students see that, hey, my teacher's really passionate about God's word. He loves God's word and that it comes out. So one day at the end of my weightlifting class, we got an exchange student named Sandre from Norway. And... Uh, and so uh, I asked him, I said, you know, Sandre, I said, how do you like it here in the States? I mean, you've been here for almost the whole school year. How do you like it? He says, oh, I love it, Doc. And I said, oh, that's, that's cool. And he said, I've never, I've never seen a teacher with so much passion for his subject as you. And I just thought, man, that, that just made my day. And I, I told him, I said, I told him how much I love the Lord. I told him how much I love the Lord's word. I told him that, you know, because he had two of my Bible classes first semester. This was in the second semester a few weeks ago. And so I told him how much I love the Lord and how much I love his word and that I want the students to see the passion that I have for the Lord and to catch that passion. And he looked at me, he had a puzzled look on his face, and he said, Doc, I was talking about weightlifting. And so that kind of that kind of popped my bubble. So I'm, I'm hoping for the day when the students will actually see that... Uh, that my real passion is, is, is for God and for his word, and even more so than, uh, than my love for weightlifting. But this is what apologetics is. In fact, I head the Institute of Biblical Defense, and that's what we're about, is trying to defend the truth. Even an innocent man in a trial needs to have someone defend his innocence. And so God calls us to defend uh, his truth. So what is apologetics? Apologetics... Oh, there's a typo right there. Apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith, okay? Uh, it involves both defending Christian truth and refuting uh, false beliefs. Now, that passage in 1 Peter 3.15, the word for answer, some, some translations read to make a defense. The word in the Greek is apologia. So unlike the word trinity, which isn't in the Bible, but it's based on... Uh, systematic study of uh, the nature of God, that the one true God is three co-equal, co-eternal persons, the word apologetics actually is in the Bible. And, um, and we're asked to make an apologetic, to make a defense of the faith, yet to do it with gentleness and, um, and reverence. So apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll try to get a PowerPoint out to, uh, to Chris so if you're taking notes and it's going too fast, hopefully he can email you uh, a copy of the PowerPoint complete with the typos. And, uh, but there's, there's many different ways to defend the faith. I just want to give a little overview of this. Uh, this is what my, I did my PhD dissertation in, uh, probably the most boring topic in the history of mankind, and I love it. And I've only been asked to speak on it once, talking over the different methodology. I think Western Reform Seminary asked me in Tacoma, asked me to give uh, uh, 10 lectures on uh, different apologetic methodologies. 
there's the class. Now, by the way, I'm the type of guy, I'm very eclectic. I like all the different ways to defend the faith. And uh, when I'm witnessing to people, I try to see if one particular way will work better than, than others. Uh, but the classical way throughout the history of the church has been to start out with philosophical arguments for God, and then you move on. It's a, a two-step approach. Start out with philosophical arguments for God, and then you move to historical evidences uh, for Jesus' resurrection and deity. Uh, the evidentialist approach uh, basically starts with historical evidences, like Josh McDowell, my old professor Gary Habermas from Liberty University, um, so the real old guys, like 12 years older than me. Um, but um, uh, so they'll start with historical apologetics, and then they don't mind doing some philosophical argumentation for God. But they they build the foundation with the historical case. Then there's the the presuppositional camp, and th these guys, Van Til and Gordon Clark, did not like each other. They just about damned each other to hell on different occasions. Uh, Van Til blocked Gordon Clark's ordination. Uh, it was ugly, and uh, but they they both had a different types of presuppositionalism. What a presuppositionalist does is he presupposes the truth uh, of Christianity, the existence of the triune God of the Bible who revealed himself in the scriptures, and then they argue from that. And they kind of view any other argumentation, if you argue from something else to God, they, they view that as almost idolatry or blasphemy, okay? So they only argue from God to other things. And, um, and uh, but Cornelius Van Til and Gordon Clark were the two leading guys there, and they had different spins on the presuppositional method. Uh, some of the di disciples of Clark and Van Til like Francis Schaeffer and John Frame are actually what I classify as verificationalist. What they do is they presuppose the truth of the, of the Christian worldview, the Christian faith, but then they are willing to open up that presupposition to testing, something that Clark and Van Til would never do. So it's, so it's kind of like they propose, okay, they propose Christianity as the explanation for what we see, in reality, and um, and then they and then they open it up to testing, and they argue that is by far the best explanation because it is the only true explanation of reality. Uh, comparative religious apologetics. Anybody here remember the first Bible Answer Man, uh, the late Dr. Walter Martin? A good guy. He was from New Jersey, God's country, and um, uh, but. Uh, but Dr. Walter Martin, he wrote his, you know, his best-selling book, Kingdom of the Cults. And uh, a lot of guys who classify different apologetic methodologies never include comparative religious apologetics. And I think we need to acknowledge that that's the whole counter-cult movement is doing comparative religious apologetics, where you, you argue Christianity is true and the world's religions or the non-Christian cults are false. Now, for us not to have a category for that really strikes me as, as rather odd. Uh, there's a lot of people who say they don't think we should defend the faith. We should only share the faith. They'll often say, um, uh, God doesn't need you defending the faith. And so I respond to them. I say, yeah, and God doesn't need you sharing the faith either. But he still commands us to share the faith, and he also commands us to defend the faith. But a lot of people who say they don't like apologetics almost always use their testimony and how God changed their life through faith in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they use that as evidence for Christianity. You find the Apostle Paul used testimonial apologetics on numerous occasions, um, often when he was on trial. Cumulative case, apologist, that's kind of like me. I never met an argument for God I didn't like, and so you just kind of, uh, you just kind of build, well, actually, yeah, in the cumulative case, you, you, you would basically say, look, I've got a lot of different evidences, and with each of these evidences, my case gets stronger and stronger. And uh, dialogical apologetics, David Clark came up with that, and he, he deals, it's more of a person-centered apologetic methodology, so it changes with each person that you deal with. 
cultural apologetics. How many people have heard of Ravi Zacharias? When he's arguing that Western civilization is going down the tubes because we rejected God, that's cultural apologetics. My book at the back table, God, Government, and the Road to Tyranny, Christian View of Government and Morality, got a chapter there on the death of Western civilization. That whole book is cultural apologetics. I think we do cultural apologetics when we argue that homosexuality is not a healthy lifestyle and it is a, a sinful lifestyle and, um, and that God is not pleased with that lifestyle. That's cultural apologetics. When we argue uh, that we should not be killing unborn babies, that's cultural apologetics. And um, Ravi Zacharias does a, a lot of that, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. Psychological apologetics deals more with the will and the emotions of the human to argue for God than it does with uh, rational reasons. Probably the greatest psychological apologist was uh, uh, Blaise Pascal. Um, his work, uh, The Ponces, you could buy that. You could pick that up at uh, uh, Barnes & Noble right off the shelf. Ponces, he was writing a defense of the faith, and then he died at the age of 39. And um, it's just a great, great book. He's got, he's got these quotes. So nobody knows how he would have put together the book. So they just gave you know, different chapter headings and then put all the, all the passages that he wrote under different categories. So he's got like quotes like, uh, there's only two kinds of people that can be called wise. Those who serve God with all their hearts because they know him and those who seek God with all their hearts because they don't know him. In other words, if there's just the possibility of God existing, only a moron would assume he doesn't exist and just move on. Just the possibility of there being eternity and life after death and a God existing means the wise man is going to keep looking if he doesn't know him. And if he does know him, he's going to serve him uh, with all his heart. Scientific apologetics, that's where we give scientific evidences for Christianity. And uh, I really think that that... God in his creation, that the infinitely intelligent God created the world in such a way um, that we see evidence of the intelligent designer in his creation. So I remember uh, the late Dr. Henry Morris and, um, and the late Dr. Dwayne Gish, who were some of the kind of the godfathers of the creation science movement as being powerful defenders of the Christian faith by using scientific evidences uh, for the truth uh, of Christianity. Uh, just a few more of these. Reformed epistemology or basic, God is a basic belief. Alvin Plantinga, he's not opposed to using arguments for God, but he says if a Christian doesn't have any evidence for believing in God but still believes in God, he's still rationally justified. Um, because God, for some people, is a basic belief. You just know that you know that there's a God. I would, you know, I became a skeptic as a senior in high school, and I remained a skeptic for a couple of years till I went in the United States Marine Corps, and then I started looking for meaning, and I and I accepted Christ. But one of the first things that dawned on me was I used to talk to myself a lot when nobody was around. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I'm from New Jersey, so I talk to myself a lot even when people are around. Uh, but it did, nobody looks at me like I'm weird anymore because now everybody does it. They have cell phones and, and all. But, um, but whatever the case, it, I realized, you know, even as a non-believer, when, when things were going bad and I would talk to myself and nobody was around, I always felt like somebody was watching and like somebody was hearing. And... Um, and so um, I, I think planning is on to something there. In fact, even uh, John Calvin referred to it as the sensus divinitatis, this sense of the divine, the sense of God within all of us. Now, when you read Romans 1, you find out most people suppress that truth. That's just a normal thing to do. We need the Holy Spirit to come and chip away at our hardened hearts. Um, but that's very similar to this, but there is a difference, but we don't have time to, to go into it. But, uh, uh, but Plantinga, by the way, Plantinga is considered by many people to be the greatest living philosopher 
and then they'll say, and he just happens to be a Christian. Um, but it's very rare that, uh, that even, even many atheists will acknowledge a Christian as the world's leading philosopher. And then narrative apologetic C.S. Lewis with his Chronicles of Narnia and uh, the Screwtape Letters. Um, you can, if you just share the gospel by telling stories, it's got its own apologetic value. And, um, and we live in a society that doesn't care about the truth, uh, but it does like stories. And so now's the time to, to basically, you know, uh, use narrative apologetics. Now, now and you, so there's a lot of fiction writers um, that will write uh, uh, Christian fiction, Christian narratives that will argue for the truth of Christianity and may per persuade people. See, when people lit watch a film or read a story, they drop their guards. So there's a lot of people came to Christ. They didn't come to Christ by reading C.S. A lot of people, a lot of people did, but a lot of people didn't come to Christ by reading C.S. Lewis's philosophical works. You know, the problem of pain, mere Christianity, miracles, the abolition of man. But a lot of people dropped their guard when they read his fiction, like the Chronicles of Narnia. And it's amazing how persuasive... Um, the, the gospel can be when people drop their guards. And uh, so narrative apologetics. And then combinational is uh, when you start combining any of those uh, uh, other methods uh, together. And here's some pictures of some of these guys. There's Blaise Pascal, really good looking guy. He kind of looks like my, my pinky with hair. And, uh, but you could, you could tell he wasn't a weightlifter and um, sickly guy, but a brilliant guy. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I would classify his argumentation as verificational. He, he uh, verificational apologetics. He said that it was it was like uh, the the missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle or the key that unlocks the door to everything else. Uh, I like C.S. Lewis. He had a quote where he said that Jesus, the Son of God, is a lot like the Sun, the S.U.N., because not only do we see the Sun, the S.U.N through its, its own light, but it's through the light of the sun that we see everything else. And so not only do we see Jesus in all his glory through his light, he's the light of the world, but he also enlightens our minds to see the other truths. Um, that, that's is why uh, the psalmist said, in his light, we see light. And so C.S. Lewis, I would classify as a verificational apologist, as I would Francis Schaeffer, the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer, brilliant mind. Really recommend reading his books. I refer to uh, my students at Crosspoint. I've been teaching there 15 years, and for the first year that I started teaching them, I tried to get them hooked on Schaeffer. It didn't work, so I refer to them as the generation who knew not Schaeffer. You know, I think, I think every generation God sends uh, a kind of a... A prophetic messenger that sounds the warning, you know, repent. And if you don't listen to that prophetic messenger, you're toast. And Europe had theirs in C.S. Lewis, from Great Britain. And then after he died in 63, and then Schaefer became real big, and he died in, I think, what, uh, 84 or 85. And, um, and so we didn't listen to Schaefer, so I think, uh, I think things are going to get ugly. Uh, and I refer to both Lewis and Schaefer, my death of Western civilization, that chapter in God, Government, The Road to Tyranny. But he was another verificational apologist. The only difference between a verificationalist and a presuppositionalist, the verificationalist is willing to put his presupposition to the test. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, he uses classical apologetics and cultural apologetics. William Lane Craig, good friend of mine. Uh, I've met him like three times, but I mean, he's, he's the kind of guy he falls in love with you right away. But he's a classical apologist. He likes using the beginning of the universe as evidence for God's existence. I disagree with him on the age of the earth. He's an old earther. I'm a, I'm a young earther. Uh, but William Lane Craig, Two presuppositionalists, they, that's as close as they ever got with these two photos because uh, they didn't like each other. But Gordon Clark and Cornelius Van Til, and um, I would have paid to see them in a boxing match. 
And uh, I think uh, Clark died in 84 or 85, and I don't know when Van Til died. I'm sure that whoever lived long in the other one felt like he finally won the debate, but, uh, but they were... Then my old professor from Liberty University, Gary Habermas, he's a, real, he's a really neat guy, real articulate, probably the foremost expert on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection from the dead. I'll give you a little quick Gary Habermas story. He, um, I had to prepare for a debate, and so I needed to call him up, and I hadn't talked to him for years, and I always felt guilty that I only called him when I needed something from him. So I figured, let me make some small talk first. So I told him, I said, uh, you know, when he, gets, when he gets tired, his Detroit accent starts coming out, and he blows his words out of one side of his mouth. Other than that, he's articulate. But um, so I called him. I said, hey, how you doing, Doc? He said, hey, what's up, Phil? And I said, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I just got your latest book. And he said, oh, The Stroke of Jesus. And I'm thinking, The Stroke of Jesus? What how would he go, nuts when I left Liberty? You know, it's like, what? So I said, oh, no, no, that sounds like a winner, Doc. That sounds really good. He said, well, well, what'd you get? I said, I got the historical Jesus. And he said, yeah, that's what I said, the stroke of Jesus. So uh, so just if you, if you go listen to one of his lectures, make sure you catch him when he's not tired. Uh, although it, it'd probably be a little entertaining hearing about the stroke of Jesus. Uh, and then another one of my former professors, uh, Norman Geisler, just got to see him in, uh, in Denver out there, meeting the International Society of Christian Apologetics. He's like 82 years old, so he's getting up there. So, um, But another brilliant uh, uh, apologist. And then one of my favorites, the, the late Dr. Walter Martin, a comparative religious apologist, the first Bible answer man, an author of Kingdom of the Cults. Oh, Henry Morris, there's a scientific apologist who also liked the classical arguments for God. He went to be with the Lord a few years ago. That's, you know, sad when you see these great guys living, defending the faith, and then dying, and most of the church hasn't heard of them because they didn't build a mega church. You know, they didn't make Christians feel good. They did the hard work of defending the faith. By the way, if you want to get into a ministry that takes a lot of hard work and you make absolutely no money at it, apologetics is the way to go. So... I, uh, I teach at a Christian high school and pastor a church to support my apologetics habit. Uh, now, the anti-apologists are fideists, okay? Uh, a fideist, fideism is the belief that Christianity should merely be believed and not defended. Faith and reason do not meet, okay? So they would actually agree with Richard Dawkins when he says, if you, if you believe in science... You're rational, uh, but if you believe, if, if you uh, believe in Christianity, it's all of faith. He acts like faith and reason don't overlap at all. By the way, very few philosophers hold that view. Because, you know, right now I'm, I'm expressing a lot of faith right now. Okay? I'm suspended several feet over the ground. If I fall, I could get hurt. At my age, I would probably die if I hit the floor from a a distance like this, and, um, um, you know, my way of getting down from here to there, if I'm a former Marine, I'd have to repel. Um, but I'm expressing faith in man's technology to build stages, okay? And you don't think I'm a fool because you're expressing faith in man's technology to build chairs. But I think your faith is a reasonable faith, and hopefully you think that my faith is reasonable faith. I don't come to this church. Maybe, maybe your pastor went right through the thing and you're thinking, boy, this, this guy's an idiot. He don't know what he's doing up there. But, but, uh, but whatever the case, uh, faith can be rational. Okay? Well, God told Abraham, say, Abraham, look, if you can count the stars, you'll be able to count your descendants. Abraham looked at the stars and he believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. I think that was a rational faith. I think he realized the one who's telling me that he's going to raise a n mighty nation from my wife's barren womb is the same one who created the universe. If the creator of the universe doesn't keep his word, nobody can. And I think that's a rational faith. 
I think when Jesus rises from the dead and appears alive to people, I think the rational thing to do is to say what Doubting Thomas said, Hakoriasmu kaiatiasmu, my Lord and my God. I think that was the most reasonable thing. I think somebody only as irrational as Richard Dawkins would look at the risen Christ and say, nope, he didn't rise. Um, I mean, even Richard Dawkins, he acts like he's real rational, but he acknowledges that the universe has the appearance of design. And then he explains why he thinks that's an illusion. That's not very rational. That's not very scientific. That's anti-rational and anti-scientific. If the universe, if science is examining the world of appearances through the five senses, if the five senses tell us that the world was designed, then science is telling us the world was designed. Richard Dawkins thinks he's going to get a pass just because he, he calls it an illusion. I'm sorry, uh, I don't uh, bow before your altar, uh, Mr. Dawkins. But Soren Kierkegaard was probably the most famous fideist, and it's kind of your inward beliefs were so much more important than the objective facts that it really wasn't important that Jesus rose from the dead. All that's important is that you subjectively believe that he did. Now, when you look what Paul has to say on the issue, you find that Paul was not a fideist. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 3 to 8, we don't have time to look at that, but it's an ancient creed giving a summary list of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And so Paul was willing to say, hey, I have faith in Jesus because of the objective evidence. Jesus proved that he conquered death by rising from the dead, leaving the tomb empty, and appearing on numerous occasions. And then in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, your faith also is vain. So he's saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm wasting my time right now. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you're wasting your time. If Jesus of Nazareth, if his... If his corpse rotted in a tomb, it's all a joke. Okay? Uh, verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Paul believed that Christianity was based on objective facts, on the objective reality of Jesus of Nazareth's death and resurrection, that he really did rise from the dead. He really did give evidence for the early church to believe in that. And so the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to argue the early church, and uh, uh, was not, they were not fideous. They were willing to give evidence uh, for faith. Um, and so let's look at the biblical basis for traditional apologetics. And the first reason that you need, if you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. The first reason is that the Bible commands us to defend the faith, okay? Peter says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Set apart Jesus as the Lord of your hearts. And the way you do that is by making a defense of the hope that you have, yet with gentleness and reverence. And again, we get our word apologetics from that. So Peter uh, tells us under the inspiration of God that we are to make a defense of the faith. Paul says the same thing in different words in Colossians. Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Paul says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, toward non-believers. See, wisdom, the word in the Greek is sophia. Philosophy it comes from two Greek words, philos for love and sophia for wisdom. So that's why C.S. Lewis argued, God is not opposed to philosophy. He's only opposed to bad philosophy. Okay? We should be lovers of wisdom since our God is infinitely wise and all true wisdom comes from him. Uh, Paul says we need uh, to deal with those outside the church with wisdom, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. And so Paul is telling us to defend the faith. 
uh, in, uh, in Titus. Listen to what Paul tells those who want to be pastors of churches, the overseer. And I'll just read verse 9 of Titus chapter 1. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times we think the pastor is a super Christian. No, the pastor is not a super Christian, but as a minimal qualification for being a pastor, he's supposed to represent what a mature Christian is like. If the pastor's not a mature Christian, you need to boot him out and get a mature Christian behind the pulpit, okay? So the pastor is not, you know, super Christian. The pastor is just supposed to embody what a Christian is supposed to be like, what a mature Christian is supposed to be like. And what he says about the pastor, that he is holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine. So the pastor is supposed to encourage you in sound doctrine, okay, and to refute those who contradict, okay. Um, it comes with the turf. The pastor is not only supposed to ground you in the sound teachings of God's word, but he's also be, supposed to be able to refute uh, the false teachings that are out there. And believe me, it's getting harder to refute the false teachings because of the Internet. That whenever you refute one false teaching, a new one pops up right behind it. And uh, now the big thing is the Jesus myth hypothesis, that Jesus never existed. He's just borrowed, the early church borrowed from pagan myths. They talk about the Mithras cult and all this other stuff. And boy, it sounds like a powerful argument. They talk about all these different pagan gods who were born of a virgin, uh, who died for the people's sins, who rose from the dead, and blah, blah. But then when you actually read the sources, uh, you don't have any of that in pagan literature until after Christianity started to spread. So if borrowing went on, it was in the other direction. And then Jude 3, Jude wanted to write a nice, warm, fuzzy letter and share with these Christians about their common salvation. But then he said, but I couldn't do that because false teachers have crept into the church unnoticed. And, um, and so he basically wrote this letter uh, to encourage us to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So we not only share the true faith, but we contend earnestly for the faith. We defend the faith. So reason number one for doing apologetics, for defending the Christian faith, um, is because the Bible commands us to defend the faith. And again, people will say, I've had Christians say, well, wait a minute, we don't, God doesn't need us to defend the faith. Yeah, he doesn't need us to share the faith either, but he commands us to do that. And, uh, the, you know, doing apologetics apart from the work of the Holy Spirit um, is like trying to pound a nail um, uh, into applesauce. It's, 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 it's a useless endeavor. But if the Holy Spirit commands us to do something, then if we prayerfully do it, the Holy Spirit will be involved uh, in that work. Uh, reason number two, the Bible speaks of natural revelation. This is what drew me to creation science and creation apologetics is because God created the world in such a way that his evidence of God's existence is obvious uh, to any honest observer. The problem is uh, we're not honest observers. And so that's why we got to argue for this. Um, but... Um, you know, Psalm 19.1, King David says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. I don't know if he wrote that while he was a king. I tend to think he wrote it while he was a shepherd. A shepherd in the flock, you can get pretty lonely at night, but it's really good for your devotional life. And he's probably leaning against a rock, maybe eating a little bit of food and looking up at the stars. And it just came to him, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Let me, you know, you can look at the most beautiful painting 
of a, a, a sunset or a sunrise or a starry night. You can look at the most beautiful painting of that, and only an ignoramus would say, oh, yeah, but the artist, that it probably was no intelligent artist. That probably happened by accident. Maybe some monkeys threw paint on the canvas. No, 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 nobody's that ignorant that they would say that. Yet, when an artist paints a beautiful painting of the skyline, okay, he'd be the first to admit that the actual sky itself is infinitely more beautiful than his painting. So what makes us think the painting has to be done by an intelligent artist, but the real thing got here by chance? It, it doesn't make sense. We're just, human beings are experts at suppressing truth and lying to ourselves. Romans 1, 18 to 22. Uh, Paul again talks about evidence for God, evidence that is so clear that your heart would have to be as hardened as Richard Dawkins to deny it. Uh, but Romans 1, 18 to 22, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. That's what John Calvin called uh, our immediate knowledge of God. It's evident within us, okay? For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Literally, they are without apologetic, okay? So Richard Dawkins really doesn't have an apologetic a defense of atheism. He has a smokescreen that intelligent Christians need to remove so that, uh, that people can see the truth of, of God's existence and the truth of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened professing to be wise, they became fools, okay? So Paul makes it very, very clear that God, we have not seen the invisible God, but we see the visible work of his hands, so we know that he exists, okay? So God has revealed himself to us uh, through nature. Even in Romans 2, 14 and 15, Paul says this, for when Gentiles, the non-Jews, who do not have the law, they didn't have God's law written on tablets of stone, and they certainly didn't have God's laws written in the, the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And so what the Apostle Paul says is that within the hearts of even Gentiles, even the pagans, within their hearts, God has given them a knowledge of right and wrong. Now, because mankind, because we became experts in perverting the knowledge of God in creation and the knowledge of God, God's laws in our hearts, our moral consciences, God decided, okay, I need to start writing some books because mankind is perverting more and more my revelation of himself in nature. And, uh, and so we see clearly in the scriptures um, what is much more vague, more because of our finiteness and our fallenness than anything else, but what is vaguely out there in creation. But we can use the evidence of God in creation and the evidence of his moral laws in our consciences to argue that there must exist God. Do you realize if no God exists, if no God exists, there's no solid rational basis for believing that anything is wrong and anything is right? So it's what Cornelius Van Til said. He said that people who deny Christianity 
and deny the existence of the God of the Bible, they live on borrowed capital from the Christian worldview. So the atheists will deny the existence of God, but then they'll resurrect a few Christian values. Okay? So you got people saying, look, you Christians are wrong to share your morality in the public schools because there's no such thing as wrong. Well, wait a minute. If there's no such thing as wrong, then Christians are never wrong. Please leave us alone. Um, uh, but they're constantly... Uh, Humanist Manifesto number two, the atheist authors, it was signed by the world's leading atheist, Paul Kurtz was the editor, but Humanist Manifesto number two says that we are for all sex between consenting adults. Okay? And so they act like we're, we... Oh, but they say, that's right after they say that we believe that all moral values are uh, autonomous and situational. Basically, they're saying each person decides for himself or herself what is right and what is wrong. Okay? Well, they just contradicted themselves. Because if they believe sex is between consenting adults, then they're saying that rape is wrong. They're saying that pedophilia is wrong. Yeah, but if each person decides what is right or what is wrong for himself or herself, then rape and pedophilia are not wrong. Every once in a while you get a consistent atheist. I questioned Dan Barker in a debate in 1999, um, or actually it was in 2000, February 29th, 2000, at Bellevue Community College in a debate. I asked him if rape and incest are wrong for all people, all times, and all places. And as the audience was laughing at me, he said no. Because he's a consistent atheist. He realized if God doesn't exist, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Um, and so God has not only revealed himself to us in creation, hence we can argue from the creation to the creator, that's scientific evidence and philosophical evidence, uh, but we can also argue from our consciences that if there is such a thing as right and wrong, then there has to be an... If there are absolute moral laws moral laws that apply to all people at all times and all places, then there has to be an absolute moral law giver. Okay? And by, by the way, there really is no such thing as a moral relativist. Moral relativist says there are no moral absolutes. But then they'll protest for animal rights or woman's right to abortion or whatever else it is that they're protesting for. So everybody lives like Christianity is true. I had my, um, one of my brightest students was Albin um, from Sweden last year, an exchange student who was a fire-breathing atheist and a big Christopher Hitchens fan. And uh, so he would argue that there's no such thing as right and wrong. I even got him to admit in class that since God doesn't exist, that Adolf Hitler's acts were not wrong for all people at all times and all places. So he's a very consistent atheist. But when we would leave the philosophy of religion class and go to the weight room to lift weights, he would constantly argue with the American students that European socialism is the best form and most ethical form of, of, uh, of government and that we should fight for uh, rights to homosexual marriage. And so what I did there is we were all lifting weights. I just interrupted him once and said, hey, you know, for a moral relativist, you sure sound like a moral absolutist. When you, when you leave the philosophy class and you go uh, into the, uh, the real world of the weight room. Um, reason number three, the Bible speaks of eyewitness testimony and historical evidences. That 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, Paul talks about the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and he appeared to the apostles, and he appeared to, to James, he appeared to the apostles again. He appeared on one occasion over 500 people at the same time. Paul says most of them are still alive. This was 51 AD when Paul's writing this, or about 55 AD when Paul's writing that. And, um, and then he says, and as last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul was like the baby born in the 11th month because all the other post-resurrection appearances of Jesus were before the ascension. Uh, Paul's came about a year after the ascension. 
And, uh, but Paul's willing to point to uh, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus as eyewitness and historical evidence that Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead. When you look at the, the book of Acts, how the early church defended the faith, but Acts 1, verse 3, uh, Luke is writing the sequel to the Gospel of Luke to his buddy Theophilus, and he says, to these, to the apostles, he also presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs. See, Jesus was not opposed to giving proof for his claims, okay? By many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. That's why Henry Morris authored his book on apologetics. I, I still recommend people buy the book. It's not outdated. It's, it's current. It's solid. But the book is by Henry Morris, Many Infallible Proofs. And he got that from that passage. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Peter is preaching on the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, he says, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Just look up witnesses, the word witnesses in the Strong's Concordance, and see how many times the apostles say that they were eyewitnesses of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. They were not saying, look, you just got to believe. If I give evidence for Jesus rising from the dead, then I'm a blasphemer or an idolater or a misrepresenting Christianity. They said, no, no. We're going to give you the evidence we were eyewitnesses. We saw him risen from the dead. Um, even uh, Jesus himself will speak uh, uh, of evidences for his claims. You know, can you imagine if God became a man and gave us no evidence that he was God and then just, just said, yeah, but just believe in me? Uh, Acts 5.30 or John 5.36 But the witness, Jesus is speaking, but the witness I have is greater than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Jesus is saying, my miracles prove that I'm from uh, the Father. That's why the, the man born blind, he was like telling the Pharisees, this guy opened the eyes of a man born blind and you don't know who he is and where he's from? And you're supposed to be the theologians? The blind man figured it out. Uh, John ten thirty eight. John chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus just said, I and the Father are one. He claimed to be God. They picked up stones to stone him. Verse 38. But if I do them, uh, then you do not believe me. Belie uh, but, but if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I and the Father. What Jesus is saying is, if you don't believe my, my words, then you ought to believe in me at least because of my works, because of the miracles I perform. Jesus was giving evidence that he was who he claimed to be. In fact, the Apostle John wrote the, the whole Gospel of John to give evidence so that people would believe. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written, the miracles in the Gospel of John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John says, look, I'm giving you the miracles that I, I witnessed Jesus perform as evidence so that based on this evidence, you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believing in Jesus uh, you would be uh, saved. And so the Bible speaks of eyewitness testimony and historical evidences, Jesus giving evidences for belief in him through his miracles. Reason number four, the early church defended the faith. Okay, Jesus himself gave evidence for his claims. Okay, so Jesus actually did apologetics. He gave evidence for his claims. In John 2, 18 to 22, he cleanses the temple. Okay? They say, well, what sign do you give us to prove that you have the authority to cleanse the temple? 
and he cleansed the temple by beating up a bunch of guys, overthrowing their tables and, and kicking them out. And uh, they said, what, what evidence, what sign do you give us? What miracle do you give us to prove you have the authority? And he said, the only sign I'm going to give you is you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And he said, well, it's been, it took 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it up in three days? And John said he was talking about the temple of his body. Okay, Jesus said, I'll prove to you who I am by uh, rising from the dead, giving evidence um, for his claims. And we already looked at 536 and 1038 that he used his other miracles as well as evidence proving that he was who he claimed to be. Luke 24, 36 to 43, the apostles thought they were looking at a spirit when Jesus appeared to them in the upper room and the doors were locked. Jesus said, hey, guys, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see that I have. Here, touch my wounds. And then he said, hey, give me a, give me a piece of fish. And he ate right in their midst. Jesus was, was all for giving evidence. He didn't say, hey, look, I know you think I'm a spirit, but just believe that I'm not. Believe that I, I bodily rose from the dead. Uh, he said, look, you want to touch me? Touch me. Okay? I actually think the apostles did touch him. Ignatius said that they touched him. He wrote in 107 AD. He was a pupil of the apostles, selected by the apostles to lead in the early church. Bishop of Antioch, Assyria. Pretty good church. That's where Paul and Barnabas were from. Uh, but even John talks about that in 1 John. What we have seen and heard, what we have touched, you know, we proclaim to you also. And... Uh, um, and then Acts 1-3, um, uh, where you find, again, that Luke is saying that Jesus gave many convincing or many infallible proofs that he had risen uh, from the dead. So reason number four, the early church defended the faith. You can look at Peter. We looked at Acts 2-32. You can look at these other passages, Acts 3-15, Acts 5-30-32, Acts 10-39-41. Peter is giving you eyewitness testimony. We are eyewitnesses. We, see, we have seen him alive uh, after his death. And he even throws in the fulfillment of prophecies. By the way, Matthew does that over and over again. Uses as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah all these prophecies that Jesus has fulfilled, giving evidence for faith. We saw how John said, the reason why I wrote the Gospel of John and told you about these signs uh, was so that you would believe. So these signs proved, these miracles proved who Jesus was. And, uh, and John uses that evidence. Luke, again, brings up the many infallible proofs, uh, the many convincing proofs to Theophilus that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, Jude, willing to defend the faith, and commands us to contend earnestly for the faith. Look at, a, look at Apollos in Acts chapter 18. This guy was actually trained in philosophy and, and rhetoric. He was a, a very eloquent speaker. He was from Alexandria of Egypt, which at that time had the world's largest library. It was the New Athens. It was, the, um, it was at that time the, the, um, the kind of the capital of philosophical thought. He had been trained there, and when he... Uh, accepted Jesus as his Savior. Look, look at what he did in uh, Acts 18, verse 24. I'm in the wrong chapter. Okay. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, so that means he's a learned man, trained in, in speech, came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the Scriptures. Okay, and then it goes on. And it says in verse 28, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, dem in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So he turned to scriptural evidence to defend uh, the belief that Jesus had fulfilled these passages and was uh, the Jewish Messiah. And then we have the Apostle Paul defending the faith. This list can go on and on and on. Um, 
Acts 9, 22. But Paul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. See, and by the way, as you look at Paul's MO, his mode of operation, Acts 17, I think, talks about it, verses 2 and 3. It says, and according to Paul's custom, this is the way he normally did things, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now what happens, though, is when they reject uh, when they reject, when the Jews rejected him. So Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he would first go into the synagogues and prove from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Then when they would beat him up and kick him out, he would shake the dust off his sandals and then go into the marketplace and start uh, defending the faith with the pagans. Now, when you go to the Greeks, they don't believe in the Bible. They didn't believe in the Old Testament. So he had to use other evidences there and he reasoned with many philosophers there, uh, like you can see in his uh, in Acts 17, his Mars Hill sermon, where he's dialoguing with uh, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. He even quoted from two ancient Greek poets, not exactly biblical passages. We are his offspring. We're God's offspring, he says, and he's quoting from their poets. And he says, in him we live and move and have our being. So Paul's saying even pagans sometimes even get it right. Then he even defined common ground. He says, look, you guys got statues to all these different gods. Uh, back then in Athens, there was, uh, he said there was more altars to pagan gods than there were people. And he said, I noticed, I looked around, and I, and I, I want to compliment you, Paul says. You're a very spiritual people, a very religious people. You realize that there's more in life than just this physical realm. However, there's one thing I got to tell you you got a statue to an unknown God because you were afraid you might have missed one. I'm here to talk to you about the unknown God. The God that you don't know is the God that I know. And he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he's the one true God. And, uh, and so Paul was willing uh, to, in fact, even in... Uh, even in Acts 14, 11 to 18, Paul says that God did not leave himself without a witness. He gives us the rain and season. You know, wow, what a coincidence. It rains when we need rain so we can grow our crops, so we can eat, and we can go on living. Wow, what a coincidence. No, that's evidence that God designed the world in such a way. I mean, scientists call that the anthropic principle today, from the Greek word anthropos for man. And what they're saying is, when you look at the Earth solar system and then you look at the universe as a whole, if you just change, you know, like if the sun was any closer to the Earth, we'd all, we'd all roast to death. If it was a little bit further uh, away, we'd all freeze to death. You change the chemical composition just by 1% or 2% in the opposite extremes of the universe and there'd be no life on the planet Earth. So they say, well, the, the universe appears as if it was designed to sustain human life on the planet Earth. But then these brilliant scientists say, of course, that can't be the case. It sounds too much like Genesis 1. So then they come up with all these alternatives to try to explain away what the anthropic principle is telling us. The Apostle Paul, his response is more logical, okay? If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If, um, if we get rain when we need it so we can grow our food, so we can eat our food and stay alive, and, um, and the universe is set up in a way that sustains life on the planet Earth, somebody designed it that way. And uh, um, we already looked at Titus 1, 9, Colossians 4, 5, and 6, and then 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 
For we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of God. And so Paul was, was saying that it's our job to de destroy anti-Christian speculation and, and everything that mankind considers lofty and brilliant that attacks the true knowledge of God, we've got to oppose that and, uh, and fight against it. So the early church defended the faith. Uh, the Bible talks about historical evidences, evidence of God in nature, eyewitness evidence. Um, and so I would argue that apologetics is biblically based. Not only does God command us to share our faith, but he also commands us to defend our faith. Here are, I'm just going to close with this, four reasons why I believe apologetics is needed. And the first reason is to confirm the faith of believers. Um, we subjectively have the witness of the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, I, I, let me tell you, I told Dan Barker he thought I was uh, copping out, but I, I don't expect a non-believer to understand this. He told me, what would he have to do to disprove God's existence? And I said, you'd have to not only prove to me that God existing is some kind of a contradiction and that Jesus was somehow a fake, you not only have to make a case there, but even if you made a case there, I would question and think, you know what? Maybe I'm not properly reasoning here. I said, but you got to understand, I don't just defend uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus. I know him. I encountered him. So I said, so refuting the existence uh, of God is like refuting the existence of my brother Mark. You could produce documents that supposedly disprove his existence. I would never believe those documents because I met him. I knew him. I had a love relationship, continue to have a love relationship with my brother Mark. And uh, so uh, at the same time, it does help a little bit when the world's attacking the gospel. Maybe we've had a bad day and we're kind of starting to doubt a little bit. It does help confirm our faith when we find reasons for, for belief. And, uh, and believe me, God gives us lots of reasons both in the word and in nature for belief. Number two, to persuade non-believers by removing intellectual stumbling blocks to the gospel. Um, I get probably at least three or four times a year, I get letters from people who read my books or listen to my lectures online or watch my lectures online of guys thanking me and saying that I, my uh, apologetic ministry was instrumental in them coming to Christ. Now, obviously, it's the Holy Spirit that changes hearts, but apparently the Holy Spirit not only uses our sharing of our faith, but he also uses the defense of our faith as well. Reason number three, to stand up for what is right even when no one is listening. If everybody in the world became pro-abortion and pro-homosexual marriage, I would still speak, up, speak out against it. Okay? So to me, as far as I'm concerned, I, it doesn't even matter if anybody's listening. The truth is still the truth. And God commands me to share the truth and defend the truth. And then reason number four, to show the world, whether it likes it or not, Show, to show the world that Christianity is not irrational. And I'll close with one example on that. When John Lennox was debating Richard Dawkins in one of their many debates, Richard Dawkins said that um, if you believe in God, it's a faith. If you could prove Christianity is true, it would no longer be of faith. It would be of reason. So you can't prove your faith is rational. Reason and faith never meet. And then John Lennox was leaning on his pulpit, an Oxford scholar, and he said... Uh, he said, well, surely now, Richard, uh, you have good reasons to have faith in your wife. And Richard Dawkins said, of course I do. And then the entire audience laughed. And the only guy who didn't get it was Richard Dawkins. He has good reasons for having faith in his wife, yet his faith, his trust in his wife is still faith. So your faith can be a rational faith. Um, our faith in Christ, we have good reasons to believe in the Lord Jesus. We got the empty tomb. We got the post-resurrection appearances. We got this beautiful, well-designed 
universe. We've got this moral conscience, this knowledge of right and wrong. We've got all this evidence that proves the existence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the God of the Bible is the one true God. And um, I think sometimes we got to show the world that Christianity is rational and it is the only reasonable way to view reality because Christianity is true. And uh, so I don't know if we just open it up for Q&A or... You guys, uh, thank God for Dr. Fernandez, would you with applause? We're going to take up an offering briefly. If you guys want to uh, prepare, I had asked a couple guys to help, so they're going to be coming forth. Again, uh, we, need, we have a lot of expenses here, and we don't, uh, related to bringing these speakers in, and we don't want this to cost the church anything. So make your checks out to Cedar Park. We turn all the money over to them, and then uh, make, do check requests as necessary. You can use the envelopes that are in the back of the chairs there. If you want to dedicate the funds elsewhere, you may do that using the offering, uh, using the envelopes. Otherwise, everything that's taken up goes to support this specific program. Okay, so help us with what you can. We've got uh, a lot of speakers coming in from out of town. So if you don't want me speaking every month, then uh, you got to help us because, I don't know, maybe you want funds. I better not say that because maybe you want me speaking every month. That, uh, don't you, aren't you thankful that we have people like Dr. Fernandez out there helping us with uh, some of this stuff? It's awesome. Okay, we want to open it up for some questions. So if you got something to fire out at Dr. Fernandez, I'll bring the mic around. We've got the house lights coming up. Just so you know, you're streaming live here, so uh, you're out all over the world right now. Dr. Fernandez, one of the uh, most powerful apologetic stances I've used has been uh, prophecy, written and then fulfilled. Where does that fit in your uh, list that you had? Yeah, fulfilled prophecies, uh, I love them. And um, I narrow them down. I take what I think are like the, the 25 most convincing Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. But you can go even, I mean, there's hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Um, but then uh, you can even go to uh, prophecies of cities, prophecies of countries, you know, the, Nobody gives the Bible credit, but the Bible says Israel is going to be around even in the, in the end times. It said that thousands of years ago. It said Egypt's going to still be around in the end times. It said the Philistines are going to be wiped out. I haven't bumped any bumped into any Philistines lately. Um, it says the Edomites are going to be wiped out. I haven't seen any of them. And uh, so you could you could just start listing different countries, different cities. When the Bible says they get demolished, they get demolished. Uh, when the Bible says that they'll be around in the end times, lo and behold, they're still around. So, uh, uh, but yeah, the fulfilled prophecies are really strong. Now, if somebody, if, if you're dialoguing with an Orthodox Jewish person, then you could really use it to argue that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And uh, Daniel 9, 24 to 27 says the Messiah is going to be cut off and have nothing. It's going to be executed before the temple is destroyed. Well, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., now, hundreds of guys claimed to be the Jewish Messiah and were executed before 70 A.D. However, the book of Isaiah says that the Jewish Messiah will be rejected by the Jews, yet receive a wide Gentile following. So let's give that some thought. What guy claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, was executed before 70 A.D., was rejected by the Jews and received a wide Gentile following? Let me tell you, you notice... This building was built probably by Gentiles to worship a guy who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. And there's buildings like this all over the world. Only Jesus of Nazareth was executed before 70 AD and has a wide Gentile following. So, I mean, just, just those two prophecies alone, Jesus is the one. Um, but, um, and, and, and by the way, nobody denies that the entire Old Testament was written before Jesus walked the earth. We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've got copies of the, the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So it amazes me that New Testament scholars, critical New Testament scholars, for some reason don't even like looking at the Old Testament prophecies. So if I'm talking with New Testament scholars, they just don't even go there. But if I'm talking to real breathing human beings who, who actually have a life, 
uh, yeah, then, then uh, the Old Testament prophecies are phenomenal. And then you can even go in the New Testament. Jesus made some pretty, pretty cool prophecies. He not only predicted the destruction of the temple and then a lot of predictions about the end times. Um, uh, but Jesus even said that the kingdom of God is going to start out like a little mustard seed and then grow uh, to be the biggest uh, tree in the garden. Um, he said it's like a little bit of leaven that when added to dough, it spreads throughout the entire dough. What Jesus is predicting is the church is going to start small and grow to be the biggest faith on the planet Earth. That's a pretty bold prediction for a guy who, when he left planet Earth, at most he had maybe 620 followers. Um, so, uh, so sometimes I don't think Jesus gets enough credit for some of the predictions he made. But yeah, using the Old Testament prophecies and some of the predictions in the New Testament I think is an astounding way to defend the faith. There are certain groups within academic circles that don't go there. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you want to be that way, go ahead. But when I talk to real human beings, yeah, I'll use uh, Old Testament prophecies. And I think it's one of the best ways to argue that the Bible is God's word and that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that we better get right uh, with God through faith in Jesus. So thank you, sir. The presuppositional um, apologetic is espoused by uh, creation science, evangelism, Ray Comfort's group, Answers in Genesis, uh, Saitan, Bruggen, Kate, different ones like that. What's your view on that? Do you think that is the best approach, general approach, or what? It's, re it's really, really weird because I'm, I'm eclectic, so I love, pre I mean, I've read... I loved Greg Bonson's works. I read plenty of Van Til's works. I read about 25 works from Gordon Clark. I love presuppositional apologetics, but I'm a both end guy. I, I like presuppositional approach and I like the traditional or classical approach. The presuppositionalists, for some reason, um, they like referring to go those who use traditional arguments for God. Those who argue from anything to God, they like to sometimes say we're blaspheming or we're idolaters. And so it's a very narrow view that you can only defend the faith their way. Now, as a philosopher, I would argue it's, it's got more to do with Immanuel Kant's rejection of traditional arguments than it has to do with anything that the Bible talks about. And um, I think it's dangerous for creation science um, because I think, I think Henry Morris was on the right track using traditional arguments for God and realizing you can argue from creation to the creator. If the presuppositionalists are correct, you can only argue from the creator to something in creation. And if the people you're dialoguing with don't believe in the creator at the start, why would they give you the first premise? So a lot of it has to do with, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the Calvinist position that regeneration precedes faith. So the Holy Spirit's going to regenerate, he's either going to regenerate you or he doesn't. So we're going to argue from God, and if you don't accept it, that's just because he didn't regenerate you. But I would agree with, with Calvinists like R.C. Sproul um, and some of his colleagues that you could still be a Calvinist and argue from creation to the creator. And, um, and, uh, but I think what's dangerous about it for the creation science movement, if you're saying you cannot argue from creation to the creator, then it kind of makes me wonder if the creation science movement has any dialogue with the unsaved, if it's just gonna be an in-house thing to confirm our faith. Um, but I do think that you can argue very effectively like Henry Morris and Dwayne Gish from the creation to the creator, uh, but that's kind of uh, violates what the presuppositionalists believe. So, so I would disagree. I love them and I love their work and I learn from it, but uh, I add that as arsenal in my defense of the faith uh, I think it's exactly right. It's kind of a lot like C.S. Lewis's argument from reason that there's no way for us to know that human reason is valid unless we believe that our reason came from a rational cause. So if, our, if human reason, if human knowledge, if our thinking ability evolved from non-rational matter, then we have no reason to trust what our reason is telling us. Ronald Nash quotes from Richard Taylor on this, where it's like a lady's driving the train into Wales, and she's never been to Wales before. 
And she sees these white stones on the side of the hill that say, welcome to Wales. Well, she's free to believe, and that's going to represent human reason, the welcome to Wales. She's free to believe that those stones accidentally rolled down the hill and randomly spelled out welcome to Wales, that there was no intelligence behind that. She's free to believe that the reason got there through non-rational causes and just arbitrarily spelled out welcome to Wales. But if she believes that, she has no basis to believe that she is entering Wales. The atheist wants it, wants it both ways. They want to say our reason got here by chance, yet I really want to believe I can know what my reason is telling me that I really am entering Wales. It doesn't follow. The only... The only reason for us to trust in our reason is if, our re if we were created in the image of a rational God. And, um, and I wish Richard Dawkins would himself get away from his blind faith in human reason and in, and in science and do the rational thing and acknowledge um, that if there's not a rational cause a rational God who created us in his image so that we're rational beings, then there'd be no way to trust what Richard Dawkins thinks his, his reason is telling him. But I love the presuppositionists. They don't, unfortunately, they don't love me. They use a, a lot of really harsh rhetoric. And, um, uh, but I think the creation science movement does a dynamite job when we argue from creation to the creator. So I've been told by a lot of creation scientists that we don't defend the Bible. They act like that's a sin to defend the Bible. And then they do a good job defending the Bible. See, if, if you're innocent and I'm your defense attorney, because I have to defend you doesn't make you any less innocent. And uh, I don't think it makes God any less majestic or any less great uh, if he commands us to use some of the evidence that he gave to us to defend him. Another thing is that Everything that we know had to be revealed to us by God. We have a supernatural revelation when he does miracles or when he writes the Bible, but we also have his revelation in nature, natural revelation. So if I'm using God's natural revelation, what God has revealed, to argue for God, I don't see why I'm, I'm you know, doing something that dishonors God. God gave us uh, that revelation in the first place. So that's kind of my, my view. I'm more of a both hand. I like presuppositional apologetics and I like traditional apologetics. But I think if the creation science goes only in the presuppositional camp, I don't know how we can reason with non-believers to come to Christ when we have to start with exactly the thing they're rejecting. And, um, and that's the existence of God. So. Um, I was wondering how you would recommend people getting involved in apologetics if they're just getting started without college and PhD and that kind of thing. Yeah, very good question. First thing is that we have to acknowledge that we are commanded to defend the faith. So even if you haven't been to college and you don't have a PhD or a master's degree, every one of us is called to defend the faith. At the very least, we could defend the faith just by sharing. Or you know, somebody says, "Well, why should I believe that Jesus is real?" You can use your own testimony. Um, then you could step it up a few notches and use Old Testament prophecies uh, that that were fulfilled. Um, but uh, but I would say that there's uh, with the internet, and uh, you know, you don't even have to buy the books or go to a library anymore. You can just go on the internet and go to websites and learn how to defend the faith. I, I have over a, a, a thousand lectures or sermons and, and entire apologetic courses. You can get an entire master degree level of apologetics lectures for free just from my website alone. And um, so basically you don't have to go out there and spend tens of thousands. I needed to because I knew God was calling me to debate at Princeton and that at the uh, University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at Washington State University, I, I needed to do that study. But I think, you, I think somebody could be just as educated as me reading the, the right books at home and studying at home. And um, so, um, so I would just say go to apologetics websites that you trust and see what books they recommend. And uh, you could get started tonight. You could... My books back there, they're free. 
And we suggest a $5 donation, but if you don't have the money or you don't think it's worth $5, just take a book or two for free. If you see, hey, I really like six books, I can't choose between them, take all six books, okay? Um, so we really don't have an excuse. Now, you know, back in Jesus' day, just to read the scriptures, you had to wait in line at the synagogue, memorize a portion of the scroll, put it back, go under a fig tree because it was so hot out there, and then meditate on what you memorized. Now, I mean, you don't even have to order the book from Amazon.com. You could just, you could read stuff online. And uh, so, um, so I would say just, just go to solid apologetics websites and start doing it. And, and by the way, um, most Christian apologists with one or two PhD degrees uh, that I know um, will acknowledge scholarly work when they see it, even if it's from someone with no college training whatsoever. Um, and when I see a Christian scholar bad-mouthing somebody just because they don't have the right degrees or the right initials after their name, that really upsets me. I expect that from the world. But when I see worship of academia within the church, that's, that's disgusting. But I very rarely see it among uh, apologists. I mean, William Lane Craig, I hadn't seen him for years. And first time I saw him after not seeing him for like five, six years, he said, how's, how's your wife Kathy's back? To this day, I don't remember William Lane Craig's wife's name. Okay? He remembered my wife's name, and he remembered that she had a bad back. And you know why? Because he'd been praying for her for five or six years. And, um, and, uh, and I, I always tell big-name Christian apologists, I tell them, Thank you for being a Christian first and an apologist second. And you know what? They all look at me like I'm a weirdo. Like, what did you expect, dude? You know, it's just, and, um, but, um, but I would say, I would say just, you know, you can get the education without even going. And, and the thing is, God's going to call us to different levels. God might only call you to defend the faith with your next door neighbor and your coworkers and your family members. Um, God might call Hines to debate Richard Dawkins someday. So Hines has got to do more homework and has done more homework than probably all of us put together. Uh, but that's just Hines being Hines because God called Hines to be Hines. Phil, I'd like to tell you I really appreciate you coming here to uh, talk to us. So my question is about science and how that word is used. Uh, you gave a great definition. Science is explaining the world through the five senses. But in some of the conversation, you refer to science one way or another way, and I think it comes down to the difference between what is really science versus what is the interpretation people put on it. I'm just wondering if you can speak to that and add a little bit of clarity for yeah. us. So, the word science just means knowledge, but in ancient Greek philosophy, one branch of Greek wisdom began to study the world of appearances, the world of nature, the world that we could discover through the five senses. And, and they began to call that knowledge science. And so it just, it kind of just st stuck. Now, I will, let me say this though too, the Greeks did not invent science. Because when you read very closely about King Solomon, he was doing a whole lot of biology. He was doing a whole lot of science um, you know, 400 years before uh, the Greeks started even looking into that kind of stuff. Um, but it really amazes me that brilliant scientists like Stephen Hawking could be so ignorant as to say that philosophy is a total waste of time, only science can give us truth, and he doesn't even understand that's a philosophical statement. He also doesn't understand that science, by definition, cannot prove the existence of a, of a physical world outside of our minds. You just try to do it. Try using your five senses to prove that a world outside your mind exists. You have to assume a world outside your mind exists and that your senses are giving you basic, reliable knowledge about the world in which you live. So that's basically what we're, what we're saying is that you have to make a whole lot of philosophical assumptions before you even start science. For instance, when you do experiments, when you do experiments and you report the conclusions of your experiments, I would hope that scientists are honestly 
reporting the results of their scientific investigations. But when was the last time a scientist put honesty in a test tube? How much does honesty weigh? What color is honesty? How far can you throw it? Can honesty be bounced? Okay, uh, honesty is not, it's, it's in the realm of philosophy and theology. It's not in the realm uh, of science. And um, so, uh, and I think also what we need to understand is that science, through the world of the five senses, we've all been driving down a road on a hot day, and we say, oh, there's a big puddle coming up. And then when we get down the bottom of the hill, there is no puddle. Okay? And I don't think our senses were deceiving us. I think we just misinterpreted what our senses were telling us. And so we have to be very tentative. I mean, Newton thought he had it all figured out, and then came Einstein. And now with quantum physics, some people are wondering, maybe Einstein got it wrong. So science should be done in a very tentative fashion. I once spoke at a conference not far from here, in Bellevue, and one of the other speakers uh, was uh, Russell Humphreys, I believe is his name, a young Earth creation scientist. And, um, and he has two models of the universe, two proposals. The, he does some, uh, you know, two theories as to how the universe came to be that, is, that are consistent with Genesis chapter 1. He's a young earth creationist. Then he has a buddy who has another model of the universe, young earth model of the universe. That sounds pretty reasonable. Then there's Barry Satterfield, formerly from Australia, I think now he lives in Oregon, that believes the speed of light is slowing down. He has a model, uh, a cosmology that explains a young universe. And they're, they're all literalist and young earth creations. I, well, I asked Russell Humphreys, I, I said, uh, do you think either of your models is true? He shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, maybe. I wasn't there when God created, but I'm, I'm just saying you can take current scientific theories and put them together in such a combination that the world would appear to some to be billions of years old, but in reality it would only be 6,000 years old. So, but that's the way science is supposed to be done, where you realize that, um, hey, this is very tentative. By the way, the scientific method only applies to operation science. Uh, repeatable processes that are going on right now. Because you have to, uh, the scientific method starts with observation. So you have, so the observable, repeatable processes. But when you talk about creation versus evolution, you're talking about origin science, a non-repeatable sing, non -repeatable singular events of the past, okay? So the scientific method would be more like witnessing a crime taking place. Origin science is like circumstantial evidence. There's nobody observing it. And so you get fingerprints and blood and things of that sort and DNA testing. And you try to build the most plausible explanation. And, um, but most scientists act like evolution is proven by the scientific method and it's not. It's not observable. There's, nobody's observing um, uh, simple beings evolve into complex beings. Uh, nobody's evolving life. Nobody's observing life evolving from non-life and stuff. So, so most scientists are not even good philosophers of science. And I would include Richard Dawkins and, and, and Stephen Hawking in, in that list. They're, they are not good philosophers of science. They don't even understand the boundaries of the field in, in, in which they are. Most scientists are great scientists because they're experts at, you know, this guy's an expert at studying rocks. This guy's an expert at studying fossils. But then often the scientist will draw conclusions that he has no greater knowledge or study in than uh, the garbage man. You know, so, um, but, but this, the, we, have, we have deified science. So I like that there's young earth creationists who are humbly doing their science the way science was supposed to be done. And um, Isaac Newton and many of the founders of modern science believed that they were thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, when we come up with mathematical equations that work to explain complex things in the universe, 
Doesn't that tell us that there was an infinite mathematician who designed the thing in the first place? So, uh, so I think we need to be much more science. Good science ought to make us humble, not a bunch of arrogant jerks who, um, like Romans chapter 1, are not grateful for the beautiful creation God has given us, but instead they hate God. You know, that's, that's my big gripe with the new atheists. And they bring it out in that movie, God's Not Dead. I've been saying it for decades as it were other apologists, but if you don't believe God exists, Richard Dawkins, why do you hate him with so much passion? All right, let's, get, let's thank Dr. Fernandez. Before I have him close us out in a word of prayer, I'm going to get us out here quick. I just want to remind you of a couple things we got coming up. Let me back up. That's Dr. Fernandez's website, instituteofbiblicaldefense.com. You can go in there and find some of the resources that he was talking about. Remember that we have the creation conference coming up in two weeks. That's at Wooden Valley Baptist Church just down the road on 228th here in Bothell. And Mike Riddle is going to be here next month, not only speaking here at the symposium, but doing a an all-day workshop for teachers that Saturday that's following, June 21st, an all-day workshop for teachers. You can pick up some additional brochures for the creation conference back there in the bag, some information from about the uh, all-day teachers workshop as well. And I wanted to uh, also point out that tomorrow, Dr. Larry Vardaman, who uh, was the head of a research team that was investigating radiometric dating, over many years, the Institute for Creation Research and the Creation Research Society had a joint team of scientists that were working on radiometric dating, and they published two large compendiums on their work. And he's going to be speaking tomorrow night up in Arlington. There's a group up in Arlington that meets once a month and has speakers come in similar to this. So if you're a little further north, they're called the Apologetics Forum of Snohomish County. And if you want to learn some more information about uh, these kinds of events. There's a lot of events taking place. There's a lot of uh, field trips coming up this month. You can, uh, you can uh, sign up for our email list and find out about these things that are coming up. There's a sign-up sheet back there on the back table where Shane is checking people out on the books. Or you can go to our website, nwcreation.net, and sign up for it there. Heinz Liglama is back in the back. Heinz, why don't you hold up your hand? He's the one that's organizing the apologetics forum up in Arlington. So if you want to learn some more about that, and uh, they're meeting on the on the fourth Friday of the month. Is that correct? As a as mo most regularly as possible. Again, same as us, barring facility use use uh, issues and those kind of things. And we are streaming these live every month. So you not wanting to discourage you from coming in and attending these live by any means, but you can send out emails and let people know that these things are coming up. We need it help from people. Uh, we, we would like to see the attendance on this grow substantially, so do what you can to help us. With, with publicity in particular, we could use help. You can pick up some posters. They're the, on your way in, you, you picked up a, a black and white version of the poster for next month. There are some color versions of that back in the back. You can get some color posters similar to that one back there in Shane in the back and uh, post those at your place of work or library or whatnot. So we really need help with publicity, either that or sending out emails. Um, we're bringing in some really high quality speakers, but we need you to help us bring people in. It's very difficult to get churches to advertise educational events that are taking place in other churches. They're very protective. They want to only advertise things that are taking place in their own church. It's really difficult. So, but if you're attending church somewhere else, maybe you can help with that as well. We, you know, next month, feel, uh, think about bringing some snacks in. We got lots of people bringing snacks, but that's also something you could help with. And we could also use help with things like, uh, you know, camera operators. We could use some additional people operating cameras and those kind of things, or helping us with setup and cleanup. Show up. We we need some help. We would like this to become. Uh, you know, something very, very significant. So help us bring people in, considering uh, consider how you can help otherwise. Go onto our website, again, nwcreation.net. If you want to see the, these talks will be recorded and put on our website after we get the videos processed. But as well, the creation conference that we've organ organized for the past 10 years, all of those seminars have been videotaped, and those are available on our website, so you can watch those free of charge. Even several for Dr. Fernandez, 2000. 11, I think, 2007, yeah. if I remember right. 1947. Something. Well, I don't know about 1947. Are you older than me? How old are you? What's that? Huh? How old are you? I was born uh, the first day of 1960. 60, yeah, a couple years, so 50. So you got me on a couple years there, but 
So also, our other, we also have a creation wiki. I'm not sure how that letter got wrapped around there. We started a wiki that's uh, similar to Wikipedia, but just uh, on the creation point of view. So if you want to go in and look at that, it's awesome. Think about half a million hits a month and that kind of stuff. We're on YouTube. You can subscribe to us on YouTube there and uh, like us on Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Just, just trying to get some promos out there. But really, you know... Think about coming to the conference in two weeks. Think about bringing some people back here next month. Mike Riddle is absolutely awesome. You'll love Mike Riddle. He's a adjunct speaker for the Answers in Genesis. Been there many years. Michael Ord's coming in July. Also going to be awesome. So help us get the word out there. These are important educational events. Discipleship requires education, not just social social activities. Am I right? All right, Dr. Fernandez, close. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure. Yeah, I just got one more announcement. The three guys that came with me, if you raise your hands, you give these, and there's one back there, he's not listening, but uh, but uh, these guys deserve a round of applause for helping me come out here. But I need to say this they are union, so they can only help me carry the books into the building. They're not allowed to carry it out. So please. Take as many books as possible. I'm getting up in years, and I've already had my workout today. I don't want another one, but the books are free. Take as many as you want. So I will close with a word of close prayer. Out, you just bow your heads. Father, in Jesus' precious name, this was a, a hot evening. Uh, I know it was uncomfortable for a lot of people, so I know that the people that were here and uh, and stayed throughout this, this long lecture, um, I know that they're people who love you. And they're people who love your truth, Lord. And so I, I pray, Lord, that you, you bless these people. That you, uh, you just fill them to overflowing with your spirit. And that you comfort them. And uh, you just give them the, the assurance of their salvation. And you give them the boldness, the same boldness that you gave to the Apostle Paul. So that they would share their faith and defend the faith and proclaim salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ and through him alone. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd, you'd help them with what they learned tonight and what they're going to continue to learn throughout these seminars and uh, throughout their studies, but that you would just remind them not to, to learn this stuff, so just to be smarter, but they would learn this stuff uh, to use it when they dialogue with others, that they would have choose to use wisdom, to have wisdom with those who are outside the church, that they would make a defense of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We love you, Lord, and we long for the day when we see your son face to face. Until that day, may your spirit empower us to be all that you called us to be. Uh, you're our God. We love being your people. And uh, just... We just pray for that day when your son returns. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.